אם יש לנו 20 דקות טובות לעשות את הדיון איתם. And again, the different uh, questions on the spectrum between sanctity and tourism and archaeology. So let's take some questions. My uh, comment is actually to you as the moderator and not to the panelists, but as a, again, somebody from tourism, who is also the deputy of the Association for National Tour Guides, I want to say about that introduction, about that law for tourism services, that it seemed from your words that there is some sort of an attempt by the government to sort of control the narrative. And this law, this attempt to, to pass this law, you know, was to basically create an understanding uh, who is allowed to be a tour guide. Uh, and any authorized tour guide, certified tour guide, is allowed to be a tour guide, whether it's a Palestinian, a, a Israeli, Arab, Druze, Muslim, Bedouin, or Jew. Again, there's no control of the narrative. A tour guide from the East Jerusalem, uh, again, are certified by Ministry of Tourism. And from the Palestinian area, we, you know, according to the Paris Agreement, there are 24 tour guides who are certified and allowed to, uh, again, guide in Israel. But again, to pass a law to say that only an Israeli citizen can do so will actually put an end to all those thousands of tour guides from Italy and Poland and Argentina who come here with their narrative. Sometimes it's an anti-Semitic narrative. And they have, again, no control over their statements. And when an Israeli tour guide who walks around with a group to Italy, the minute he holds a microphone, he'll be arrested in those places. But when that group comes to Israel, when they cross the Allenby Bridge, by law, there's an immediately a Jordanian tour guide. And that is how it's supposed to be, because in corrected countries, certified tour guides are those who can guide, just like attorneys, just like doctors. So the law doesn't come to exclude a narrative. And nobody really checks if those Palestinian tour guides that have very much, you know, evaluate my colleague here and esteem him, and I have other friends from East Jerusalem, let them talk about this, you know, uh, this sort of bile, this dual narrative or triple narrative of all the residents of the area. Okay. Since I was sort of placed into this discussion, so I will, I will respond later on with the rest of the respondents, okay? A number of remarks, if I may. There aren't holy sites. There are sanctified sites. So, again, the fact that certain places were sanctified 2,000 years ago, uh, that makes it, again, makes it more holy than a, a site that was sanctified 100 years ago? I don't think so. Anyway, another remark. I think that there's no contradiction between this topic, that the archaeological excavations are done scientifically, and the fact that they are a political tool as well. Because I think any place that's called the holy place or sanctified site, forevermore, eternally, again, will, you know, is always will be something political and economic. Now, this has been arranged in all different religions all over the globe. Now, with regards to the utilization of archaeology in order to promote, let's say, the Jewish narrative, I think it would only be natural, and I'm actually quite surprised at the fact that among those the three sort of big three national waves that we have, we there's only you know, the there's only one that is uh, um, that is Jewish. The three sides. I mean, we have this uh, Caesarea, Beit Shean, they Roman. Also, Tipori is Roman. And I can actually talk about other things that talk about again the sanctity of the Zadokaya cave, but it's also sanctified to to others. Yes, other questions, please. Just can you please just say your name? I'm Shmulek. And like the previous speakers, I would like to remark, make three comments. The first comment, it's not true that holy sites are political sites necessarily, and that they weren't originally formed again on the back on a religious uh, on a political basis, but uh, basis of religion. 
And I think there are certain places, the minute they are disputed among a, few, among a few religions, then of course the control of them becomes political. Um, like the the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the, all sorts of examples that could be given. And um, as to the attorney, Mark, I would like to say as follows. Um, the status quo is a, a concept. And the status quo that we are talking of is a status quo that was created in the middle of the 19th century by the Ottoman Empire that basically fixed the, you know, the rights of uh, the, the Christian community in a few seven sites that were under dispute among different Christian communities. The British Mandate added the Western Wall and Rachel's Tomb, and that's the status quo. Israel is, makes sure to maintain the status quo in the holy sites, holy, the sacred to the Christian, as Jordan did during the time of the British Mandate, and it never breached the status quo for the places sacred to the Christian community. You can't dispute that. Now, if you want to sort of sanctify all the status quo, but not even status quo, but everything that happened in all the different holy sites in Israel, and if you have claims against the state of Israel, then you can come and say that, for example, in the Western Wall, we were, we were, the, during the time of the British Mandate, it, it, one couldn't pray standing, sorry, sitting only praying, the status quo. Um, actually sort of uh, said so whoever we would go to the toilet when there was not allowed to blow the, the shofar, the ram's horn. So again, don't, are you trying to sanctify the status quo? Until uh, June 1967, by the way, except for non-Muslims, it was prohibited to visit Temple Mount, not even talking about prayer. I'm sure you would want Jews who or Christians who wanted would want to would be able to visit Temple Mount and not to be beaten in the market as the Shara M courts, uh, you know, passed verdict in the 16th century. So you don't have to get, go into the definition of a holy site. But one thing I do want to emphasize: you sort of highlighted you know the director from 1981 the preservation of holy side that there was they actually determined 16 or 20 places and there were various pilots that we said and you said that israel deviated and got to 160 holy sites but these directives or these bylaws are, are, are not so important they minor because it's quite clear to all those dealing in this issue that beyond those 16 or 20 holy sites that are written in the directives there are hundreds of holy places you know holy to jews to muslims and christians that are not written in those directives and their sanctity is not undermined at all by the fact that they are not mentioned in the directive. For example, Temple Mount, again, and even uh, the, the church that I mentioned, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, is there somebody anywhere in the world that would say that this place is not holy because it's not mentioned in the directives? Of course not. So this law of protecting the holy sites gives protection of, again, of uh, penalization, uh, fewer imprisonment to those who desperate desecrate such places and again holy sites there are dozens and dozens enjoy the protection of the law for protecting holy sites and from desecration undermining religious sites and freedom of access as you know although they do not appear in those directives and in a final sentence the supreme court through the high court of justice through a specific case determined and said where a jew was accused that wanted to throw the uh, uh, pig's head into Temple Mount with a sling. And his attorney said, what do you want? Temple Mount was not defined as a holy site in the directive, so he actually did not desecrate a holy site. So I imagine that uh, Justice Banish sort of smiled when she wrote the verdict. She said, the sanctity of a holy site for Islam, Judaism, or Scripture is not... It does, it's not based on the fact that it's mentioned directly because hundreds and thousands of holy sites are known as such, as such although they were not defined in that list of 60 to 20 holy sites. And that Jew was convicted and, um, and charged with uh, the desecrating a holy site, although it was not mentioned in that list. Okay, the, you have this. Another question has to be much thought of, though. Sorry, I cannot hear the speaker, please, sir, just in brief, please. We're talking about narratives, and besides for Hussan, uh, Jubran, I don't think anyone's presenting the Palestinian narrative here. 
I'm sorry, I cannot hear his um, hearing properly. I want to know again about what about again erasing one narrative and promoting another. I want to talk about that. There's a very interesting um, examples about again the maps, tourist maps, you know, where one can see. And in those maps, there are only five Muslim places that are indicated on those maps, and three Christians, and all the rest are Jewish sites. Uh, which is even more than 30 Jewish places. So I think there is a certain, uh, 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 this is the method here. There's a system here of erasing one narrative. And, you know, despite all the presentations today, I don't understand why you still believe there is no racism here or no, um, uh, you know, attempt on the part of the Israeli establishment to try and erase one narrative and to, and to promote another. It's not a democratic state. Uh, again, I think, uh, um, but the, as was said by the professor from Southern California, how could it be in a democratic country? How could there be five million people that have no civil rights uh, um, and, and no citizen rights and some other rights? I don't understand how it can be called a democratic state. Okay, we have to allow time for each of the presenters to respond. And if we have more time, we will do another round. But let's uh, um, give them time to respond. But, you know, uh, let me tell you how uh, I understand the bill that I had submitted in 2010. The objective is to make sure that the guide is always accompanied by a tour guide by an Israeli citizen with an emphasis on citizen. And again, the answer is that for some of the residents of the center of Israel, for example, the residents of East Jerusalem, they oftentimes have a double loyalty in order to ensure that foreigners are exposed to the Israeli national perspective. We suggest to the said that anybody that organizes tourists uh, the, and tourism for foreign tourism will be guided by an Israeli citizen in order to preserve Israeli national nationalism and in order to present um, Israel in a fair way. I think the objective of this bill, which was not accepted at the end of the day, that every tour guide must be an Israeli citizen. And when Hussam Jubran, if it's accepted, again, he would not be able to be a tour guide because he's not an Israeli citizen. So, of course, I'd be, again, willing to give you the bill, uh, but it would be maybe fair for, again, Yonatan, Itai, Hussan, and Professor Noy. Why don't you relate to each one of the questions, or you can relate to each other as well? I would like to, to relate to something. It is true that uh, Jerusalem, you know, is not, uh, you know, it's Ipori, it's not, um, it's a Zaria. Um, but Israel in certain places, okay, I know there are certain places that, again, if we look well, we will find archaeological sites and national parks that Israel presents them in a more balanced way or maybe less so. We're not dealing with it. I think we are now dealing with Jerusalem. And I think that what we have tried d doing or understanding in the story is that it maybe this connects to all the different speakers and everything that relates to Jerusalem, tourism, archaeology, as well as sanctity, I think there's a huge investment in the Jewish story, and it's not proportional. And I, I dare to say that those who say it's proportional, either his and her understanding, or my and his um, uh, um, understanding of what proportionality is, is different, or he's just shutting his eyes and ignoring the facts. Let me just give you the most simple examples from 70 different sites that a Thai presented as holy sites. I don't know why I even have to have directives in uh, the tomb of Absal Absalom or in the Shiloh pool. I mean, if one wants certain directive in a certain place, I imagine there would be places that it's better not to smoke on the Sabbath or to walk in an immodest way, and that would be appropriate. But you can't really ignore the overinvestment in this regard. And you can't ignore the archaeological activities, which at the end of the day, when it is done in Jerusalem, and then they give you a, an example of the different sites that I presented on the list, and the, uh, sites where there are visitors. I actually checked this, except for the tomb of David. Every site has a ritual bath, a mikveh. Now, a mikveh, a ritual bath is a great place. It is a pit with water and a few steps that go down to the ritual bath. But in terms of tourist attractions, 
I'm not sure there are so many, you know, ritual bath in the in the burnt house and and in all the other area um, in the Davidson Center and the Shiloh pool, which is a type of a ritual bath. The whole time it's ritual bath, ritual bath. So again. I imagine that many archaeologists have already written their PhDs, but there are other attractions as well besides ritual bath that are so much more impressions, more impressive, sorry, than ritual bath, if I may say so. But I think this is maybe an ex additional example to the way in which we perceive it, and I perceive it, and other people perceive it, that there is a very uh, clear, you know, tendency or trend how. Again, Jerusalem is, is, is again um, displayed or presented through tourism and through archaeology. I think that you are right about the example that you gave about Temple Mount. But in fact, our message basically says, again, we saw according to the survey presented by Yoni, because the whole story of the holy sites is a very sensitive story. And it cannot be that the decision, what, what a sensitive place, it can't be that it will be in a ministry for religious services, that there won't be some sort of a government body that will manage these holy sites and of course there are differences between the places because in the tomb of David or in Rachel's tomb it's one thing that it's a Kaya tomb um, the its sanctity is a joke and it looks like again just trying to gain control uh, per se over the place I think they need, they need something to be more serious yeah, because decisions have to be taken on the highest echelon on the political in the political echelon even if they don't have a specific site of the holy of the holy site they cannot cannot be that there'll be certain factors that will come with a specific ideology uh, and all sorts of bodies some are messianic or have certain perceptions they will drag us to certain places without us even realizing it you know, behind the scenes, so to speak, in order to turn this whole conflict into a more religious conflict. And that is why, again, I, as attorney for human rights, was willing to write down this opinion for Emek Shaveh because I believe, and I'm sure, and I think many people here in the audience believe that as lo the more religious a conflict is, the less solvable it is. And the more the facts in the field are concrete, then later on it will be more difficult to reach some sort of an arrangement. The Western Wall tunnels that I mentioned, they were, you know, they, they built synagogues there. Now, we don't know what the plans are, and we can't even get a master plan of all the tunnels. What are they planning to do there in that underground city? Which direction is it taken? They can turn the entire area, entire space, you know, to have this whole underground level that ignores everything that's on top. But of course, the residents in the Muslim quarter and in the Christian quarter will not, you know, continue to just sit there quietly over time. This can, you know, bring about a huge explosion. If not now, then sometime in the future. And I think we're trying to place a mirror in front of us. We're trying to place a warning. We're saying to the Israeli public, wake up. There are certain factors and bodies that are doing all sorts of things. And you have to know what is happening. Thank you. Hussam, Tfadal. אני 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 באמת למדתי על על החוק הזה רק היום. אתה בדיוק דיברת על זה. אז אם החוק באמת קשור למנות אותה מורי דרך שבאים מן החוץ, אז אני, זה בסדר מבחינתי, זאת לא בעיה, מכיוון שבאופן אישי אני מעדיף דווקא לשמוע מורי דרך ימני שרוצה לדבר מה שהוא רוצה או מה שהיא רוצה. אבל זהו, זה נרטיב, זה הצגה של מציאות מסוימת. ולגבי שוב מורה דרך ספרדי, איטלקי, או ש, שמגיע הנה, או שפשוט עובר דרך הארץ הזאת ולא נותן בכלל פרספקטיבה, זה, זה פה יותר מפריע לי. הרי הוא סתם נותן איזה אמונה שלו, נרטיב שלו מבחוץ, אז גם אין לי בעיה, אבל אם החוק הוא בעצם מנסה לה, להדיר אותי ולהדיר מורי דרך נוספים שגרים בירושלים, אז מדובר בחוק מאוד בעייתי. בבקשה, חיים. Okay, thank you so much. I very much enjoy, again, this uh, discussion. I would also like to say 
Thank you to both sides. Yes, please speak into the microphone, sir. Thank you. I actually said that I, I very much enjoyed the discussion. I think part of the objective of this of this document of the paper, those those um, guiding principles, is to actually arouse discussion. Again, we started off with Professor Greenberg this evening, who basically presented you know the bullets, the principles, and it's outside in Hebrew and in English. You can take a copy. The fact that we have you know convened five or six times, I don't know. We sat down for hours and end. Thank you, Yoni. We thought there was a problem. That is why we convened for so many hours. We understand the context of Jerusalem. There's a very political context, very non-democratic context. And, you know, when we were kids, you know, um, there is always a parable. But this is not the parable. The thing is, what is happening in actual fact? Because this meeting of the civil society, of people who are trying to do something, you know, some of the responses here said, okay, the problem is not so big. There's no such a problem. Okay, no problem, no problem. I think somebody mentioned this. I don't remember who. Somebody said that the discussion is about how each side sees what a problem is. But it, we can't, one side can't decide what the problem is for everybody. If one side sees a problem in something, okay, another side doesn't see, okay, but not one person can decide. I think the whole idea idea of this paper, this document, is to try and propose certain guidelines or outlines as civil society, as people who actually care. By the way, I was born in Jerusalem, and um, again, you can partially accept it or what Yoni said. The establishment rejects uh, the paper, then come out with their own paper that's very similar. We can actually formulate a similar paper for people from the tourism industry, which is, uh, again, which is a little more complex because there is an academic discipline, archaeological discipline. And with tourism, and the thing is, what discipline does tourism sit on? But this is the activity of civil society. This is what we are trying to do. Those who join us, those who remind those who can add to it, it can take many different directions, but it emanates from this thought there are certain things that have to be arranged, that have to be rectified. There is a problem with how things are done, and, around, and, that, and this deals with um, archaeological practices. It's um, 8.30, it's actually after 8.30. Thank you to all the multidisciplinary team. People want to go home as well. Thank you to the four speakers. And join us now with Lord.